Brilliant. So um, welcome, everyone. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. David Riddle Watson to today's book hour. David teaches at Central Carolina Community College. He completed his PhD in 2019 from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. His work focuses on the intersection between rhetoric, literature, and real-world events. Watson's first book, Truth to Post-Truth in American Detective Fiction, was published in 2021 by Palgrave Macmillan Crime File Series. And he's currently working on his second monograph, Surveillance Noir, which will be published by Cambridge University Press in 2024. Today, David will talk with us about his first monograph, and which is, sorry, Truth to Post Truth, which traces the networks of thought about what is real and what is not from the Vietnam War through the end of Cold War, the rise of the post-truth moment of our present day. The book is a philosophical journey through post-truth America. His talk will also discuss making collaborative connections across disciplines and with senior scholars, among with tips for writing a dissertation that can be turned into one's first book. Welcome, David. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, I was uh, just saying I was uh, going through the horror of rereading uh, something one has published uh, recently because my mind has completely been on uh, what I'm currently working on. Luckily, the two things are uh, related. Um, I don't want to read a lot uh, because uh, I don't think anybody enjoys that too much, but I want to read just a few pages that I think will do a decent job of giving you kind of an overview of how I got to this project. So please just uh, bear with me for just a couple minutes. Uh, <clears throat> this book has humble origins. In 2015, I was hospitalized at 34 years old with a serious health issue. I spent most of my time from July 2015 until April 2016 on the fifth floor of the University of North Carolina's Memorial Hospital. Given that there was not much else to do, I watched a lot of television. I saw the entire 2015 primary. I was often confused if and when my medication needed adjusting. My feelings would change. I'm sorry, I'm going to skip a little bit. Uh, since I had basically been watching the news for half of my waking hours, I'd become focused on a new discourse I was hearing. Words like fake news and post-truth were used to describe the state of epistemology in America. I had become worried because political opponents sounded like they were describing completely different realities. There were many attempts to account for this new post-truth world, but one ideology kept coming up as the culprit, postmodernism. Try as I might, for I had some issues with postmodern philosophers, I just could not see how they were to blame. I had been teaching at Central Carolina Community College for over a decade at that point, and I knew how hard it was to get students to read anything longer than 10 pages. I knew how hard it was for me to read of grammatology and a thousand plateaus. So how are we blaming the loss of nothing less than truth on some philosophers who wrote books that not a lot of people and almost nobody outside of academia read? Well, of course, ideas do trickle down through the culture. One can understand postmodernism through popular culture, right? While there may be some truth to that, it is not as though watching the family guy use a train of signifiers to make an ironic joke is the same as making an argument about the state of the world. More importantly, the premise of, changing, of change working this way, whereby you change somebody's idea and then change their behavior, does not square with how humans exist in the world. It is not as though people used to believe in truth, read a book, heard some ideas, and then became relativists. We are not disembodied atomized cells who operate based on rational arguments. We come to know the world by the way the world resists us, pushes back against us. We come to know the world by others that are in it. As American pragmatist Charles Peirce points out, we come to know the world through doubt, which in turn causes inquiry. When the world operates as expected, we tend not to think much about it. However, lately, uh, we've had a lot of doubt. Doubt about the ability of our institutions to function, doubt about the state of our democracy, and doubt about those who report on the state of our democracy. This doubt has led in many directions, some of them very strange. That being said, there has been no shortage of reasons to question official stories, political motives, and media agendas in a world where a divided public is a very profitable media strategy. So now that I had a problem, I needed a way to write about it. It seemed to me that we all had become detectives sleuthing through web pages in the contemporary world. Then it occurred to me that this would be the angle. I would use detective novels as a way to discuss the background, the assumptions that were being made about truth throughout the 20th and into the 21st century. In this way, the texts were picked as a means to explore a philosophical argument about truth that I want to make. 
While I have selected works that I believe are representative of their era, it will be apparent that I am stretching the definition of detective at times to include amateurs. That is to say, anyone could potentially be a detective as long as they are engaged in a quest to assemble clues and arrive at the truth. For example, I discussed the online conspiracy theory QAnon and the way their members attempted to do detective work, which led them to the Capitol on January 6th. Also, while this work is primarily concerned with American writers, I do on occasion refer to other texts. However, the analysis is always done in service of the larger point about contemporary America and the post-truth world that we inhabit. So that gives an uh, idea of what I'm kind of looking through. And if you give me just a page or two more, I will promise I will stop reading to you. Uh, this is from the introduction. People make true statements all the time, but rarely does anyone then demand a theory of truth. If one were to make such a demand, problems would immediately arise for essential concepts such as truth and meaning possess an elusive quality. One can feel the pressure start to form in the temples of the forehead upon hearing questions like what is the meaning of meaning or what is the true definition of truth? However painful as they may be, these questions are at the core of what is often referred to as the human condition and thus unavoidable. By the equally elusive phrase, the human condition, I mean, as Martin Heidegger explains in Being in Time, that we are the beings who inquire about our being, and not simply an idle reflection. Rather, this questioning stance toward the world we find ourselves in is fundamental to who we are as a species. We care that the world has meaning. As another existential thinker, Albert Camus says, man demands meaning. Though few would disagree that people make true statements all the time about everyday things, there has been a rising fear that no consensus exists regarding what makes something true in the first place, and thus what to do when people disagree. While people may agree that the snow is white or that it is raining outside, they can, when it comes to questions regarding the political climate, for example, appear to live in two separate worlds. Critics have seen the election of Donald Trey Trump in 2016, as well as the growth of populist and nationalist movements elsewhere as evidence that truth has become irrelevant to the success of popular discourse. As Alison Flood writing in The Guardian explains, in the era of Donald Trump and Brexit, Oxford Dictionaries has declaimed post-truth to be its international word of the year, which it defines as relating to or denotating circumstances and what objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion. Right, so if I stop there, I think you kind of get the idea of what I'm sort of looking at. So uh, the title of my book can be a little misleading. I mean, this is, if you wanna learn the history of detective fiction, this is not the place. <laughs> That's not really what I'm doing. What I'm trying to do is look at the background assumptions in different areas of detective fiction and how those assumptions led to truth claims. So for example, in the world of Poe, you know, you go, we get, closure, right, and certainty, and all of our doubt is resolved. And, you know, many writers of detective fiction sort of point out that the classical formula is you disrupt the moral order, with murder or something like that. Then we have doubt, who did it, is the world moral. But by the end, we have returned and restored morality, right? So we're, we're back. And in that world, and even in Poe, there's a, one of the this, uh, this story, um, um, Oh God, the, the murder in Rue Morgue with the orangutan. There's a point at the end where Poe can uh, assume, or the detective, I'm sorry, uh, can assume that everybody has read the newspaper, right? And that this newspaper is creating this thing called the public. And they are basically through this forming a coherent background, right? Um, so I go from there into the hard boiled detectives uh, where you get this world weariness that wasn't in the, uh, previous detectives. Um, I sort of uh, relate this to not just World War I, but World War II and the atomic bomb, depending on the date of the particular story we're talking about. So whereas some of the people that I'm debating in here want to argue that postmodernism has caused all of this, and I do critique postmodernism to some degree in here, I think that misses the sort of historical uh, events that have led to the distrust that is creating this climate where we don't always know how to take information. So for example, I go through the Cold War and in the Cold War I argue is sort of the beginning of postmodernism because it's at that point where every statement can be interpreted ironically. You know, it, it could be a CIA operative. You could be hearing something that is not true but is meant to make you act, right? 
and so in the uh, world of detective fiction, for me, we're getting into a moment of uh, instead of uh, finding the truth, we're, we're producing the truth. And in this, um, for me, the big moment here, and there's also sort of a Marshall McLuhan thing that's happening in the background of my argument, uh, that when the medium of entertainment changes, uh, it's going to change the way the population uh, exists in the world. So whereas uh, the newspaper created the common public, uh, when I get into the postmodern, I talk about the Kennedy assassination, which to me is this uh, very uh, uh, interesting moment where we often say seeing is believing, but everyone sees it and we don't know what happened. And whereas in our previous detectives, they were always one clue away from the truth, right? We just needed to find that one last thing and we could go ah, and go back to our world. But in this new world, the problem isn't that there's not enough evidence, there's too much evidence. So now we've went into this mode of production where with the Kennedy assassination, again, it's not that we don't know enough, there's too many possible theories. Um, I talk about Don DeLillo's book, Libra, inside of that chapter. And uh, there's a character named Nicholas Branch and his name Branch is also, you know, uh, kind of on the on the head there, but he, he is uh, responsible for putting together all of the documents about the Kennedy assassination, and he keeps getting more and more documents till finally he's had it to he's had to add on to his house to keep adding the documents. Right, Delillo is sort of making a, a joke, um, and I also talk about pension in this chapter too with the crying of Lot Forty Nine, um, where we sort of uh, get into this world of the paranoia, and. Uh, you know, in a sense, uh, again, from my point of view, the, the paranoia is not rising from nowhere. There, there becomes uh, very good reasons to distrust official stories and narratives, right? I don't think it's just some French philosophers. Um, the problem I, I have with the postmodernists, and I don't, this might get a little afield, is that a lot of, um, if I think about the history of philosophy, um, which I go through in about five pages, so <laughs> it's, it's very quick. But uh, the history of philosophy, you know, if you think about 19th and 20th century, at first it was the idea that there was sort of, uh, we're over here and then our consciousness is here and then there's the world over here and consciousness becomes the medium. In the 20th century, it's not consciousness anymore, but it's language. And so there's this idea that between us and the world, there's this thing called language. Um, and, uh, the implication of that would be if one would change the way they talk, you would change reality. From this, we get like the Sapir Whorf hypothesis that if we don't speak similar languages, we might in fact be in different worlds. Um, Sapir might be the enemy of my book um, if <laughs> in a strange way. Uh, I don't, I argue pretty hard uh, in here that you don't need to share a culture, a language or anything of this, anything like that. Uh, to be able to come together um, in a common world. I actually think it happens all the time. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the next major historical event um, is uh, for me is 9-11. And now 9-11, we're into the internet age. And especially with web 2.0, everybody's become a detective, right? And so, uh, with 9-11, we got the rise of these uh, sort of post-truth documentaries like Loose Change and In Plain Sight that basically argue that Bush planned and brought down the towers and they became you know, very, very popular conspiracy theories over here. Um, so for me, that turns the person into a different kind of uh, thing. We can't just turn the news on and get told uh, what's going on. And at the same time, uh, because of the rise of the internet, uh, one of the big uh, results, I believe, has been in this new media strategy that I believe is, is kind of at the core of a lot of our sort of problems, at least in America. Um, there's almost a, a mythical way we, we will talk about uh, like Walter Cronkite and our um, newscasters from like the 60s and 70s and 80s, right? And it's not as though they were just like, you know, the halcyon days where the government just told you the truth about everything or something like that. But because of the media strategy, and, and for me, this all kind of comes back to Noam Chomsky's manufacturing consent. Um, the goal when there's three networks 
is to basically uh, get the widest possible audience. So, you know, you want the uh, radical right wing uncle to be able to watch the same news as the kid in the Che Guevara t-shirt and them all to get along without nobody changing the channel. Right. And so the most logical strategy in that world is to basically play it down the middle um, with the rise of cable news. And then we saw the strategy first with Fox, but it's it's overtaken all of our cable news now. Now it, it just plays to an audience. So they basically it's audience capture. We know what you want to hear. We know what will make you turn the channel. So as long as we can convince you that all of your problems are those people on that other channel, uh, we, we sort of have a a business strategy that's very, very good for profitability, but very, very bad for American democracy, um, which at the heart of what I'm trying to write about is essentially that. I mean, what I'm arguing is that we need to become better detectives because our democracy is at stake. Um, if you'll uh, bear with me once more. Uh, I, I argue here, and this is coming off the philosopher Donald Davidson, I, I sort of take um, phenomenology and American pragmatism, and they both have a lot of overlapping um, arguments that I find very appealing to uh, get us out of some of the problems. So I argue along with Donald Davidson that uh, objectivity is intersubjectivity. And <clears throat> Here it says, uh, traditionally subjectivity has been opposed to objectivity. In most cases, the former is associated with opinions, things that come from subjects, and the latter with the way things are, as in the table is there whether or not you believe in it. However, after the rise of postmodernism and the belief that reality was mediated through language, how could anyone be sure exactly what <clears throat> was there in common for everyone? Perhaps as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis had suggested, there was a linguistic relativity that could not be overcome. We see present day conversations everywhere about cultural appropriation and inclusive language, as well as discussions of privilege regarding who should be allowed to render what complaints. These examples suggest that rather than inhabiting one shared world, we live in enclaves, perhaps sharing gross topic space to use the term from the city and the city, but not ontological reality. How many students upon learning about some of these ideas posit a form of this question? Maybe what you see as red is not what I see as red, thus falling prey to a skepticism that often leads to the perverse truth claims, there are no absolutes and everything is relative. However, these objections to a shared reality have been answered similarly by two different and often opposing philosophical schools, schools themselves that often see the other as living in an alternative world continental philosophy and American pragmatism. From the continental side, existential phenomenologists like Martin Heidegger and Maurice Merleau-Ponty have done much to combat the theory that we are isolated Cartesian subjects who bump up against objects in the world. On the other side of the pond, American pragmatists from William James to Donald Davidson also refuted the Cartesian cogito as foundational for rational thought, similarly challenging the traditional split between self and world, subject and object. In his essay, The Primacy of Perception, Merleau-Ponty explains the intersubjective nature of perception through his phenomenological account of being in the world. He begins with the concepts Heidegger outlines in his analytic of Dasein and being in time and applies it more specifically to one's body. The idea of blending and defining the object in question is very much what Davidson means when he suggests that communication begins where causes converge. So <clears throat> that's important for Davidson. I'll say that again, He's, Davidson argues that communications begin where causes converge, right? Uh, I wrote a book, you have an organization that hears about books, we're all here and that's why we're talking. And the, when, he's, when he, he goes, um, and Merleau-Ponty uses the point. So the example I'm giving is from Merleau-Ponty again. He says, if a friend and I are standing before a landscape and if I attempt to show my friend something which I see and which he does not yet see, we cannot account for the situation by saying that I see something in my own world and that I attempt by sending verbal messages to give rise to the analogous perception in the world of my friend. There are not two numerically distinct worlds plus a mediating language which alone would bring us together. That is to say, no one would ever be satisfied with you pointing to something and they not seeing it and you go, well, I guess it's just in my world. Like that just isn't how our experience uh, tends to line up. At least I, I don't uh, think so. Um, <clears throat> so one of the uh, analogies I use in here is Jastro's duck rabbit illusion. 
that we're all looking at the same thing, but we're not seeing the same thing. And so what's happened is, um, but rhetorically, if, if I hope everyone knows the duck rabbit illusion I'm talking about, it's, you know, depending on which way you look at it, it's a duck or a rabbit. Um, you know, if, if your buddy just sees the duck and you tell him it's a rabbit, it's not that you've said an argument, you just said something that doesn't, you sound like a crazy person. So if you're over there saying it's a rabbit, it's a rabbit, it's a rabbit, that's, that's just confirming his belief that you're a crazy person. You have to reorient, you have to shift the field. So you have to go, you know, that thing that you think is the uh, bill of the duck is really the ear of my rabbit, right? You have to change the way they're seeing something. Um, and in that negotiation, that is uh, where I think we can get somewhere. Uh, to use some examples, I, I use a scene from The Wire. Uh, it's like the fourth episode of the first season. Um, Bonk and McNulty, uh, I hope somebody's watched The Wire. It's like my favorite thing to watch ever. Bonk and McNulty are um, tracing a bullet. And it's a pretty, I think, popular scene. Now, they only use, I don't want to curse on the internet, so they only say the F word back and forth in various forms a lot. I don't know if that's a rule or not, but I feel like if somebody's watching that, I know they might. Um, so anyhow, um, they, they're going back and forth, and they just keep saying some version of the F word. And there's another person that doesn't have any clue what's going on. But between the two of them, because of that third point, the communication beginning where causes converge, that third point moving keeps moving the convergence. And because of that, they can always tell what the other person is getting to. It's similar to in Poe's uh, The Purloin Letter, the reason Minister D knows he can take the letter. It's not that he, he's arrived at truth in a very peculiar way. Right. Uh, you know, he sees her put down the letter when someone else walks in and he basically goes, I believe that she must believe that he shouldn't see this letter. And he does this sort of triangulating move and that sort of triangle. Davidson kind of gets at a lot. If we can fix that point like Bunk and McNulty do, that's the way we can have meaningful conversation. Um, we're not looking for platonic truth anymore. So. Platonic truth is only a problem if you want it to be something that exists. That is to say, something that would end the conversation once and for all or something like that. Um, so uh, that's more or less uh, where I, I come uh, from. At the end of this, I do go through um, the sort of a, a lot of what I just think of as like case studies. So uh, cases of us becoming bad detectives. So to go back to Donald Davidson, he argues uh, that we need to have what he calls uh, prior theories and passing theories. So the prior theory, he goes, when you walk up to someone, you need to assume before you, you know, that what they're saying is true, given their understanding of truth, work backwards, figure out what they're saying. Um, he, he points out that most of our beliefs are, most people's beliefs are true because beliefs have to hang together. So he, he, he'll say something like, uh, you know, if, if, if you don't think uh, books are like rectangular and have pages, it's not that we have different beliefs about books. You don't have beliefs about books, right? And, and so once you have the belief about the book, then you have to have belief about trees and you have to have beliefs about printing and you have to have beliefs about ink. So there's just, our beliefs are so caught with other things that when someone says something that sounds very strange, if you sort of uh, suspend disbelief and see what they're trying to get at, right? Uh, th there's a chance in which you, you, you can sort of work through some assumptions. Um, my argument is that we've become bad at that. And I go through two different political cases. Um, on the right, uh, I go through uh, QAnon and the Capitol where uh, people became obsessed with very, very strange conspiracy theories and spent long hours uh, on the internet and uh, ended up, you know, on January 6th uh, uh, in, in, in invading the Capitol. And on the other side, on the uh, Democratic side, I talk about Russiagate, which was promoted sort of nonstop on liberal media. And um, what happens is the people that are good at seeing what's wrong with Fox News are bad at seeing what's wrong with MSNBC and the people that are bad at seeing what's wrong. And it's sort of this thing happens where uh, a lot of people end up defending ideas, not because they like the idea, but because of who's against the idea or something like that. It's a, it's a very sort of strange uh, discourse we're now having. Um, 
anyhow, um, I hope that makes some kind of sense. I don't want to, to ramble too much. Um, my favorite part of these things are the Q&A. I always feel like that's uh, the most enjoyable part. So if it's okay, I would uh, just assume uh, take questions or try to answer anything anybody has. Thank you so much, David. That's fantastic. I really like that defending, depending who's against statement you made at the end there, because it, it, is, it is in so many ways absolutely true. And yeah. what you said in the beginning, anyone can be detective, um, when, especially in a world where we're finding truth versus producing truth. It's a very yeah. fascinating dilemma that we're facing at the moment. And uh, just to kick us off as well, uh, unless there's any pertinent questions to begin with, uh, don't be shy, feel free to use the chat as well if you're unable to unmute or use the video. Um, but could you tell us about the process of, because this was first published as your thesis. Yes, um, yes. Or you, you started this process as your thesis. And Absolutely. then you worked towards publishing it as an actual monograph. So yeah. I would be very curious about the process of considering we have a postgraduate audience and early career researchers who are obviously looking for that information as well for themselves. So that would be my first part of the question. How did you go about turning this into a monograph? What are your best tips about the different types of text? Obviously, because your thesis is a very different type of text than a monograph, a book would be. Yeah. And how then you went about finding publishing? Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I absolutely had planned to talk about all of that. Um, so th th this is, uh, it's probably tough to give general advice um, about uh, topics, but I, I think when I was writing my dissertation, I started from the premise that if I was going to put this much effort into something, it was going to be a book one day. And uh, so that meant trying to find a topic that was relevant, that I thought would be interesting, not like controversial for the sake of controversy or something, but that I was talking about something that other people were talking about. Um, and so for me, I was lucky. There was a whole discourse about fake news and post-truth and that all sort of fell in line. Um, and, you know, I didn't need that much help from the world. <laughs> At a certain point, I was one the world was, I mean, I was writing in real time when uh, the George Floyd stuff was happening with, I mean, the, you know, I was trying to catch up as close as I could. Um, to what was going on. So, you know, I wanted to pick something that I thought, right, I could get a readership for to begin with. Then after I had uh, finished um, the book, I uh, found uh, at Palgrave Macmillan, they have a series called Crime Files. Um, so, you know, if I would have been smart, I might have found that out before, but but I, I, I didn't realize that. Um, so I sent uh them and, and it, I was lucky, it just fit with what they were uh, looking for. Um, the other thing that had helped me about that time was, uh, I don't know if y'all are familiar with American Book Review, but it's a, um, a journal over here that uh, uh, does reviews and special focuses. Uh, my dissertation director knew the editor and because I was writing about detective fiction, they hadn't had a special focus on detective fiction. So, um, you know, another possibility, because there's a lot of those kinds of, I think, uh, things that you can do that people are looking if you sort of straight out of uh, graduate school. And luckily, so then I had to realize that I didn't know anybody. I was not well networked. I had been teaching at a community college and I was driving back and forth. So I didn't have a lot of the community. So I started just looking up who was publishing on detective fiction. Um, and I started sending emails to uh, the people that were you know, most prolific in that area. It took a long time and I would say probably 25%, maybe 35, 40% email me back. I, I don't want to guess, but but through that process, I met some really important scholars and you can see that they blurbed the back of my book, right? And that really helped. Um, I met uh, a, a wonderful scholar named Catherine Ross Nickerson who uh, was then asked to uh, work on the Cambridge Element series for, I forget exactly what it's called, but it's another crime file sort of thing. So then I was able to email her with my idea for a second proposal, right? So, you know, um, that the ability to just um, do that, that one um, 
sort of edit job really helped me network a lot. Um, I just presented at a conference in Chicago on the American Comparative Literature Association. So that was useful because uh, the wonderful thing about the American Comparative Literature Association conferences is all three days you're with the same group of people. You can go, you go to other stuff too, but like if your group is 930 to 11 every morning. So, you know, instead of just having that one session, we got to hang out with about 12 people that were all writing on the same stuff. So now I have all of those email addresses, right? Which has also been very useful. Um, something else I did, um, I, I'm, I'm sort of an amateur art collect. I don't know that sounds pretend on me that way, but I like art and, and sometimes I pay too much for stuff. And uh, uh, an artist that I'm a huge fan of is a, a guy named Radu Orion. I'll put his name in here if anyone's curious. And um, I had uh, purchased a piece of his and um, I just found him on Facebook. And I uh, literally just said, uh, told him what I was getting out of this piece. And he asked me if I would write a catalog entry for him, which I was thrilled to do. And that led to an interview with him that's coming out in American Book Review. So, um, you know, I'm trying to just spread out there. Uh, one more thing, I, my interests are, as you can tell, kind of stretch around. I, I'm also very interested in speech, uh, First Amendment stuff in America. And so I'm uh, there's a scholar named Sophia McLennan who's done wonderful work on, on satire. Uh, I believe Michael Moore wrote the preface to her new book that just came out. It's it's called something like Trump as a joke. I can't, I might mess up the name of it, but um, I was wanting to write about uh, comedy and uh, I know this term is loaded. So whatever people mean by cancel culture, um, the, the um, I feel in my class more of a pressure to like, there's things I would have taught five years ago that I probably wouldn't teach now if I'm really honest. And, and, and um, I, I don't, you know, always know how to feel about that. So I was really interested in how people were feeling about that. And, and I wanted a really sort of vibrant debate because I don't always know how I feel about everything about that. So I contacted her and uh, asked if she would be interested in setting up a panel for MLA. I, I told her, you know, I'd be happy to do all the work. I just want to borrow <laughs> a senior scholar's name that does this work if she was interested in it. And so I'll know in a couple months if our panel got picked up. But that's what I'm hoping to do with that is turn that into an edited collection, right? And it's the same idea. I feel like a lot of people are thinking about speech limits today. And I feel like that's the kind of edited collection that a publisher would be interested in. Um, you know, think about, I, I, I try to think about the stuff I wanna read, right? And what, what do I wanna read that I can't pick up and read right now? And then if there's something I have to add, I try to jump in there. Um, I'm not sure if that answers exactly. I know that's that's a, kind of all over the place. No, but that's great. Okay. And it really showcases that then, need and importance of networking as well, which I think a lot of us, um, especially in early career researchers, you would know that already, but postgraduate, depending on the level you're at, uh, might not be as familiar with. Conferences are a fantastic way to do that, yeah. for example, because you get to meet all levels of people and all trajectories of careers and all different researches, so you never know what happens. And, you and know, a lot of it... Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, didn't mean oh, that. I was just going to say, you know, a lot of, like... When I was, throughout my 20s, I, I mean, uh, the political philosopher, linguist Noam Chomsky was just a huge influence to me. And um, I've emailed Noam Chomsky three times. He emails me back every time. So like you're, the people that seem like beyond what I could reach, because I really, the first time I sent them an email, I really just wanted to print it out and frame it. Like if I could say that out loud. But, um, you know, it, it turns out a lot of people, if you write them and tell them you're interested in their work, who doesn't want to hear that? If somebody wrote me and told me they like my book, man, I'll talk to you as long as you want to, you know? So I think if you can just show genuine interest in the things you're genuinely interested in, because most of us are kind of lonely sitting here with all these books writing by ourselves all the time. We kind of like somebody to talk to. <laughs> Absolutely. hundred percent agree. Um, if no one else has a question, did you have a question, Sam? Yeah, please. Yeah, um, thank you so much, David. I, I This is one of the really serendipitous things about um, having these book hours is that I knew very little about the subject before we started. And now I, I found your presentation so interesting. Okay. And uh, it made me think, and um, I imagine you have views on this. I, I wondered 
what you thought about the um, the news of the Fox v Dominion settlement um, in terms of you know the, the obvious um, benefit to to Fox News in in not admitting not having to admit that it had lied um, you know didn't have to issue an apology it just had to give money um, in damages um, what you think that I, I hesitate to say it, but but almost like relative truth or or the, I mean the obvious um, the obvious expediency of subordinating truth to you know audience capture or profit making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, man, I, I have a lot of thoughts, and they're not really worked out <laughs> on that. But yeah, I. So what I always end up finding myself wanting to do these days is, is to lump all of the cable news together and just go like, man, this is all garbage. Um, but uh, uh, I, but yeah, um, so the fact that they don't have to pay out a settlement uh, means they're never, their audience will never have to reckon with uh, the lie. They, they, there's something about plausible deniability that goes on, um, but I, I do genuinely think it's it's across the spectrum. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I think about the, you know, I'm a you know lefty academic like most people, but the 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 the, the friends of mine that I have so much trouble convincing them that Russia Gate didn't happen the way it did, or um, so I, I always want to think it can invade anybody, but uh, yeah, it's a, I'm going to be curious and I don't want to say anything that I can uh, be recorded that I'm wrong two years from now, but there's part of me that just wonders if cable news is just committing suicide. I mean, like I, I it, it feels uh, just radically, I feel like its relevancy is only as it spreads through YouTube. Maybe that's a way to say it. So as the clip gets clipped, you know, I think people see it, but uh, I, I don't remember the last time I, I watched any um, like on it in real time, um, unless I was watching out of anger. But yeah, I think it's, I think there's almost this thing now where every, we all know we're being lied to. And I think people are, are we're just not sure what to do. There's a sort of despair and like, I know, but I don't know what to do with this sort of uh, issue. I think people are turning to alternative media sources, which to me, can, I mean, that can be really good if you can read well and discern, and it can be really scary if you end up in some, you know, place in the dark web. Um, I find Substack to be amazing because of the people I can have access to, but it's, you know, it's the people that I like and I, you know, I'm paying $250, $300 a year for Substack subscriptions who, I mean, I can't ask anybody else to do that, you know, so that, that worries me that I'm having to work as hard as I am to get to some semblance of what I think is true. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure that answers the question really well, but I, I definitely am thinking a lot about those issues. I would be curious, what's the media situation like that over there? I'm so curious to know which, old, I mean, like. It, it. Um, well, interestingly, I would suggest, um, depending on your perspective, uh, a lot of it converges on the BBC and yeah. um, it, it gets attacked from both sides for being biased in either direction. Um, yeah. And then it gets stuck in the middle trying to essentially pandered to everybody and making fans of no one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's, uh, you know, the New York Times used to, I mean, we, we always caught it, it was the paper of record and then it's in my book somewhere, but there's, I forget the name of the headline, but it was something to the effect of Trump tests norms of objectivity and journalism. So you had the most, I mean, I assume the biggest paper on the planet more or less saying, we don't know if objective journalism is a good idea anymore. I mean, that frightens me as much as anything Fox News could do because everyone knows Fox News is not to be taken seriously, I think. I mean, I guess that's not true. There are people that take it seriously. But the academic class still thinks the New York Times is more or less telling them something that they, they can count on. And that's where I get so nervous. Um, uh, you know, most of my friends know good and well that Fox is a bunch of, you know, what it is. But... I always want to point out the same media strategy. It's not like there's one company that's trying to make a profit and the other one's just trying to say, you know, reality or something. Um, Noam Chomsky and, and, and Taibbi's book, Hate Inc., it gets Matt Taibbi's become sort of infamous in the last couple uh, months too. But uh, they, they sort of make this a similar argument that our 
we talk about the media over here like it's you know this far apart, but it's more like a goalpost where it's two factions of the business class. And as one of those factions is easier to infiltrate, like right now I would argue, and, and I have friends who would argue against me on this, I would argue that the, the Democratic Party has actually been easier for some of the State Department and FBI and CIA to kind of um, control because the threat of Trump was such a, a, a big thing. A lot of people went along with censorship that I don't think they would have went along with otherwise. So uh, yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm pretty concerned about our situation over here. That actually um, is fantastic. I'll lead to a question that I had. Um, it's kind of a twofold thing. Um, my own research is in the history, well, partly in the history of FBI and FBI's interference with media oh. and news. Okay. And um, so I was wondering earlier about this this post truth phenomenon and and how it causes polarization within U.S. borders and does it does this polarization lead to more dissidents, more suspicion on the government actions and willingness to to be a brave dissident challenging the status quo, uh, or is there kind of backsliding into that kind of surveillance state of the 1950s when, you know, the FBI's heyday under J. Edgar Hoover, and because they manipulated news, they had everyone in their pocket, they had all of that. So yeah. that kind of, what you were saying about the finding truth and producing truth, how yeah. much can we rely on these things? And that, that kind of is, is very interesting for me to see, because I see a lot of similarities to what's happening now no. to what was happening then, and which is for me, who's not an American, is, is, but in American studies and in what my research, my research has done, is terrifying in so many levels. So I'm just curious about your ideas of, of growth or in polarization, dissidence, and the kind of backsliding into that yeah. federal authority controlled me use of media so so yeah yeah i i, I th th yeah that's fascinating i would I'd like to read anything you're writing on that stuff um yeah um so for for me uh i think it's this the thing i, I and this is what i'm gonna while i'm writing about surveillance next so over here the uh twitter files have been pretty controversial because elon musk has become controversial um, I've been reading Matt Taibbi for 20 years, and I'm just a big fan of the guy. I really like Matt's work. And, and um, so uh, I have followed that uh, as close as I've followed anything. And we have a lot of pleasant sounding agencies doing very nefarious work. So, you know, something can be, you know, we have the Atlantic Council or there's with the Harvard something Klein, I forget. There's all these institutions, the election integrity project, they all sound like these wonderful, nice institutions, but they seem to all be collect or connected in ways. And there seems to be um, a just aggressive attempt to nudge conversations. And, you know, in a sort of way, I think what the social media is, it's, it's like a behavior modification technology. And if you can modify behavior 1%, I mean, if you're talking about the globe, 1% is huge. Right, and, and so, um, you know, when Matt Taibbi was testifying uh, in Congress, the uh, IRS put like a letter on his house threatening him with a uh, tax evasion. So, I mean, and then there's been some um, letters about threatens with perjury. I mean, our, um, our, our system of journalism is, is, is really becoming uh, fragmented in some ways. And journalists that I used to think would stick up for each other, even though they disagreed politically, aren't. Um, it, it feels very much like journalists are now loyal to the sort of corporate employer or not, you know, and also journalists used to come out of working class people. Journalism wasn't always a, uh, you know, elite job. So, you know, until Watergate, basically, you know, after everybody saw the, all the president's men, then this became, you know, this really kind of sexy job. And then instead of like the guy that went to city college or maybe not college being a reporter, it's people coming out of the Ivy League. And uh, I, I think this is the way institutions kind of work to, you know, perpetuate their, their sort of own uh, existence. I don't think it's some kind of grand conspiracy or anything of the sort. I actually think the people that are censoring content believe they are doing something good. Um, I was just listening to um, a uh, chat from last year with a bunch of people from, I believe it was Stanford's Election Integrity Project. I might be mistaken there. 
but somebody asked, what would you do with an unlimited budget? And essentially they said, we would like to be able to surveil um, encrypted messages uh, to see what's happening in like the immigrant diaspora because we think miscommunication and disinformation is happening there, which to me sounds like someone saying, uh, I need to, <laughs> save democracy. So in order to do that, I'm going to spy on your private conversations and make sure you're not saying something anti-democratic. Um, but what happens over here is we get caught up in cultural war stuff. So a lot of the conversations about class, about access, they get masked because of um, whatever cultural war issue is sort of the issue of the day. And that tends to take the oxygen out of things that would actually make material differences to the majority of people's lives. Brilliant, thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? I do have a few, <laughs> which I'm happy to go on with. Um, the, the the question I I just did about the dissidents and surveillance data, I kind of remember because you wrote, um, I can't remember where in the book it was, or um, if a person from Bezel, which is one of the, the cities you talk about, yeah. even stares at Ulguomo or vice versa, they can be abducted by the seemingly supernatural force called Breach, Breach yeah. are the police force that maintain a separation between the two cities. Their power, yeah. much like Big Brother from 1984, is in the surveillance state they create, which is quite a harrowing per, yeah. um, image to create. And when you relate it to the reality, um, that just reminded me of all of that that was happening. And you mentioned Watergate and the 1970s burglary to the FBI office that just kind of opened yeah. the floodgates of, of the power they were holding. It's, it's very fascinating how it relates to this concept. Yeah. And, and well, we're, we see it over here, especially in the way the two sides that are represented by, by our sort of mainstream media um, whatever side of that you fall more on, there's things that you could say all day long and you would get a million likes on social media and everyone would say, woohoo. And if you said the same thing on the other, you know, one thing slightly different, all of a sudden uh, the sort of, you know, barrage of people come. And I think this goes back to the point about doubt and belief, you know, doubt comes from other people. So when someone says something that sounds unlike what I would believe, it's like, I can either think, you know, you're just as smart as me, just as capable. Maybe I'm wrong about something. Or you can go, well, they're all crazy. That's how they sound. Let's not worry too much about them. And I think that works until it doesn't, you know? And, and I mean, I think I've been guilty of that too. I mean, there's there's things I've been wrong about I was not happy about, but I, I just had to own up to it and go, man, I, I didn't think that was what was going on. But, you know, uh, I, I think once you get, especially if you want to be like a, and I don't mean this to sound, this might sound pretentious, I don't mean it, but if, if you want to, try to maintain some kind of ability to think. I, I think being a partisan in any way is just really, really hard. You have to kind of try to see things from, I don't know that I have a list of first principles, but there's some things I definitely believe in and I want to point them out wherever because I want to have integrity during the next election cycle for somebody to go, well, he called out whatever he thought was wrong. And I think a lot of our people are losing their ability to do that because they'll only speak up against one side, which makes them it's hard to take that opinion seriously if you know it's only going to come in one direction. But that's what we're getting pushed towards. That's like all the election, isn't it? You vote for the uh, the lesser evil, not not the best possible candidate always. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, in Truth to Post Truth, your book, you kind of aim to establish a history of the path from a world where not believing in truth was unthinkable unthink to the present, where it is common to believe that objective truth is a remnant to the simpler, more naive time. So could you elaborate um, how you establish, establish or aim to establish the objectivity of truth between naive and real in the tales you examine? Yeah, that's a good question. So this all kind of came from, I was reading um, uh, the philosopher Charles Taylor's book, A Secular Age, which is this, this really big, just, just wonderful book. It's a couple months out of your life, but it's really worth it. Um, and, and he asked the question, how do we go from an age when um, basically there was no other game in town, everybody just believed in God, and to an age now where it's one option among many, the age feels secular. And that's, a, that's kind of what I'm asking in a very similar way. And, um, you know, uh, if I go back all the way to the Greeks, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the 
pre-Socratics and, and even the early Greeks almost imagined themselves as like an empty head turned toward the world. And, and the world was like poesis. It was like blooming up and flourishing. And then it, it hung out for a while and then it went away, right? That's kind of how they saw being. And then we go from that, you know, I, I mean, I'm, please excuse the jumps here, but you know, from Christianity, now you're a, you're a creature, you've been created. And the wonderful thing about uh, that is there's an order. Everybody knows where they fall in the created order. You know, bishops do what bishops do and men do what men do and women do what women do and children do, right? So it's very ordered, which is bad if you wanna have freedom, but it's good if you wanna you know, feel a sense of certainty. Um, starting with uh, Descartes, uh, just to you know, pick out, we start seeing um, this idea that reality, or you could maybe say Hamlet, I mean, if you wanted to go there, the idea that reality is, is inside of you. It's this thing in between your noggin or something, and it's these thoughts. And these thoughts may be true if they line up with representations of other thoughts, and we're not even sure if we're getting to the world. I mean, you know, Descartes, I'm not sure you ever get there. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we go through empiricism, right, but then we get the Kant's Copernican revolution, and Kant um, to radically reduce complexity, you know, his insight is uh, the way I sort of like to explain it to my class is that you uh, can't play poker if you don't know how to make a hand. So for Hume, experience is just being thrown at you like cards being dealt. And Kant thinks you have to have a conceptual scheme. So when those experiences are being thrown, you're organizing them. But now we're into this idea that my mind is actually shaping reality, which of course it is, right? But but that that, that is... Uh, this sort of idea of when taken too far, it becomes my mind in isolation is, is shaping reality or these little atomized cells that, that don't connect with other cells. Um, and so I think along with sort of Charles Taylor's idea is that there's two things happening is this internalization of the self, the idea that what I am, it has very little to do with my body and has everything to do with my thoughts. Um, the combat, so if, if that's what you believe, truth kind of is whatever you want to think it is. I guess if there's no point that, that you can touch, right, with somebody else's uh, truth. And when you have that alongside of this sort of uh, radical loss of faith in the institutions that used to provide a background, like in my idea, when institutions are functioning well, you don't really notice them. Right. Like you can imagine, uh, I mean, I'm being a little mythical here, but, you know, uh, the local school and the local church and the church bells ring and we all do the things we do and we learn some stuff and you don't really notice it because it's just what one does. Um, but as soon as, well, the church scandals and then the, you know, no one believes in education's working and then all the wrong people are getting arrested, you know, as soon as all that happens, then we notice the background and it becomes in the foreground. And once we doubt those things that used to give us a sense of stability, the world feels unstable. I mean, it's almost like an ontological condition to feel like my footing is always a little tenuous. Um, I'm not sure if that's the, that's the clearest way I could say that, but maybe that makes some kind of sense. Yes, Sam, thank you, David. Yes, Sam. David, I, I wanted to ask you a question, just following on from institutions. This is, um... Branching off a little bit, but I, I used to um, I used to teach at a, a community college in Pennsylvania, and we don't really we don't quite have the same model of um, professionally well, often professionally focused uh, uh, higher education here. You know that that provides certificates, that provides professional qualifications for you know uh, nursing, police, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I wondered um in terms of an institution what you thought the the importance or the role of a community college is uh in often like anchoring a community in a, yeah. in the ways that i've found it especially in rural communities yeah i i i love where i teach um it's hard for me to overstate uh, that um i was talking before my, my wife teaches at a a uh, more uh, elite university. Um, and we often talk about our students. Uh, I have, I teach everything from 16 year olds in like early high school, I'm sorry, early college to 60 year olds. Um, I teach a class full of motorcycle mechanics. Um, and I love it because the conversations are just, it, it's, it's so diverse. Um, and so when there's an economic recession, like our enrollment goes up when everybody else's enrollment goes down. And that's when you can really see that you are related to the town, uh, the city that you're in. 
um, you know, uh, around, uh, I, I live in a fairly small town, but you, you see these stickers on everybody's car. It's like everybody in town has either been here for a class or taught here or did something. And, you know, that's the, as I get older, you sort of go through the grocery store and more people kind of see you. But yeah, I, I really uh, genuinely like the community college. I like my students. Um, they're, in general, they're very, I think they're teachable. They're not, there's not a, a pretension. There's sometimes, I mean, if, if you look around on YouTube and find examples of American universities losing their mind, like that doesn't happen where I teach. Everybody's like nice and polite. I mean, I know other people have stories, but my classes tend to be. So yeah, I, I love the community college. They should pay more. That's the only problem. <laughs> Well, I think that's the state of higher education everywhere. They, yeah. they it's never enough for the amount of work and the amount of dedication each each of us have for that profession. You know, yeah. it, it's a passion in many yeah. ways, and it has to be as any teaching position, any research position has to be as well. I'm I'm aware of the time, so I had if there's no other questions, I do have one more. Uh, okay, so if there's no other questions, I, I just wanted to hear about your new book, because you have a new book coming out next year. And, yeah. um, <coughs> excuse me, and how that is, is it, how is it building on or continuing your current research or you, because you said the title is Surveillance Noir, which I find yeah. very fascinating title yeah. in so many ways. Um, if you would care to elaborate a little, a little. Sure. Team. Yeah, I'm going to do one of the most annoying things in the world. I'm going to try to invent a genre, right? <laughs> Which is, uh, I, I mean, I'm saying that I'm, I'm trying to use the term to make a kind of make a genre pop out that, that I think was right there. Um, so uh, I, I wrote a, this started with, I've got an essay coming out in a, a book this summer called Watching the Cops. And it's called, oh, it's, it's uh, what's it called? Yeah don't stand so close to me because I'll be watching every move you make or something like that. Uh, and, and I'm talking about uh, robotic surveillance and artificial intelligence. And I became kind of alarmed at like Boston Dynamics throwing out these spot dogs that were surveilling people, uh, basically just because I, I, I don't think it's gonna stop. I don't see any way you can spend billions of dollars on a technology, be a publicly traded company and not try to put it everywhere. Um, so, uh, I, I wrote about uh, RoboCop, uh, Charlie Chaplin's uh, Modern Times and the film um, Ex Machina in there. And I was trying my darndest to find a way to use that chapter, but I just couldn't. So it's just gonna be something different. So the surveillance noir, I'm gonna um, start with um, maybe even going back to something like, like the diary of the little, with the diary of Anne, I forget what the title of diary of Anne Frank is, um, but this idea of, of not just, I don't wanna just use fiction, I wanna talk about the, the, the feeling of being watched. And that, because I'm starting to get the feeling that everybody's, everything is being tracked all the time. <laughs> and that's the noir. So I, I don't wanna just use it to mean dark lighting or to mean, I wanna talk about this sense of dread so I'm going to be looking at things from that you would kind of imagine when I say surveillance noir, like a film like The Conversation, right, would be uh, or, or something like Rear Window. But I'm also going to be looking at um, oh, the, the, the uh, Slow Horses, um, some of The Wire, again, I might go back to um, Handmaid's Tale, I was thinking about I'm looking at uh, Jennifer Egan's new novel, Candy House. Um, I, I stretch genres. I mean, some of these, uh, uh, but it's the idea that your data uh, has now become uh, the thing that's tracking. So it's not just the, the spyglass somewhere. Um, and so I've just started taking notes and you know, I've got the, you know, the proposals in, in shape and all that sort of stuff. So I, I know the text I'm going to use, but I haven't really sort of, you know, laid, I'm going to hopefully this thing gets written this summer. Uh, <clears throat> that's my plan. But essentially, I want to talk about what it means ontologically to have that growing feeling that not just what I'm buying is being tracked, but what I'm writing might be. And just once that thought comes into your head, what does one do with it? Uh, you know, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the idea that the online world can turn on somebody very quickly, I think is a very common 
understanding now. And I just wonder what that's going to do to create what uh, one philosopher called the spiral of silence. Uh, the idea being we might all think that something is wrong, but no one's saying anything because everyone's afraid that everyone else is going to right, uh, sort of attack them or something like that. So um, yeah, I'm very interested in, like I said, the Twitter files and what, what we're learning about the uh, ability of our tech agencies to partner with government agencies. Um, the rise of AI along with that terrifies me in ways that I really can't comprehend. Um, I, I, I can imagine, you know, yeah, I, I don't even want to imagine. I, I, I teach a technology and society class. So we play with Chad GPT in there and, you know, Chad GPT knew about my book, which has all of dozens of readers, right? So like, it's not supposed to know about it. So it was a, it was a little concerning. No, absolutely. I agree. And and you get a lot of these things um, about your mobile phones now are listening to you yeah. and surrounding you because if you, you know, you're not using your phone, but your phone is near you and you're talking to your friends about, oh, I want to do a holiday, for example, yeah. in, yeah. in the Caribbean. So all of a sudden you're just getting these targeted adverts. Yeah. So and it even just want the, wanting the freedom to have the thought come into my head that I, right, to not have somebody pushing these thoughts in my head. You know, just to wake up and the world tell me this is what you need to care about the day is kind of exhausting after a while. Absolutely. And I read this article about this as well, because my brother was wondering why he's getting specific targeted ads when he's never looked at it. He's never talked about it. And I find this article, I can't remember it anymore where I read it, but it talks about how because you've been in close proximity with your gadgets to someone who's searched or discussed these things, uh -huh. that's when you're getting those in your you can probably have like edge technology will come with 5g and the gadgets will start talking directly to the gadgets as opposed to bouncing off the cloud yeah yeah Ginga, we have a question please go ahead um the, the, the dreadful phrase more of a comment than a question um i think an interesting example is um i don't know if anyone watched the alec murder trial if you're familiar with it the the lawyer who did horrible, horrible um, um, sort of stealing from, from his clients, from people who are disabled and so on, and then was con sort of, no, well, convicted for killing his wife and son uh, mm -hmm. as a scheme to get uh, insurance uh, money for his other son. Basically, they didn't have much of an evidence to convict him. Um, and they complied a sort of... Uh, um, a possible version of events based on the phones of the son of the wife and his of the steps that were taken um on the tempo of the steps whether someone was walking fast or slow and the one that absolutely just floored me the amount of the screen flips uh that the phone did basically whether it was horizontal or vertical and I don't think that the evidence was robust even with this, but they did, they really tried um, to put it all together. And I, and I think it's, I was never one of the people who were anxious about the tracking. I thought that this is the world we're living in, but it wasn't something that you could read. It wasn't an app on your phone. It was just something default in your phone that is tracking it in the background then then the the different organizations that you mentioned can pull out with the um programs that are available only to them yeah and this was something completely like horrible uh to hear i think but also yeah. um useful for the the law enforcement and so on yeah yeah no i think uh yeah i totally agree. it's 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 because it's it's so hard to have we, it's like one side of that equation has no access to the analytics you just have to say i guess they have what they're saying they have and that that's what the cell phone did um yeah it's a that's a, a very different world that's going to happen and you know i it also worries me how there's a lot of things that, that you, like the, this happened. I remember the, the, the fame, maybe one of the most famous examples is the Iraq weapons of mass destruction, uh, New York Times stories where we, this happens all the time over here where a State Department official plants a store, basically calls a reporter, then the story's there and then a different person from the same room basically comments on the story. So they get something confirmed basically in a room. And it's, um, it's a way to make something seem legitimate that, that oftentimes is not, or is, uh, you know, recently, uh, uh, 
it came out that it was, um, you know, over here, there's a, a issue with a, this Hunter Biden's laptop. And it, uh, it, it came out that, uh, you know, Biden and others, it looked like they had arranged for the FBI to all coordinate a statement saying it was Russian disinformation. Well, I mean, it wasn't Russian disinformation, but in America right now, you can blame anything on Russia. Um, now, it's, it's very strange. I don't, I don't know that most people over here have any sense of Russian history. I don't think they have a sense of Russian literature. <laughs> but if you say Russia over here, people will just start nodding. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, not to say that Russia isn't doing tons of <laughs> horrible things, but it's, it's the proportion, the way they, they sort of could get blamed for anything. And like we were back in the Cold War again. Uh, exactly like uh, you're back in the cold war but that's reading though um th by their own fault russia's own fault to be honest yeah. with the lead not not the country and not the people but their leaders uh, sure sure uh, in finland where i'm from they are acutely aware of the history and it's the same thing and it has yeah. always been the same yeah you say russia everyone's happy with it <laughs> and yeah that's yeah I am aware that we're kind of running over time. So I would just like to thank everyone. Thank you, David. Oh, thank you. Um, that was wonderful. And I'm sure David is happy to keep in touch with people if you have any further questions. Absolutely. Get in Absolutely. touch. And other than that, we're looking forward to the next book. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you bye so bye. Thank Thanks. You. I appreciate it. If you hang on for a second, David. Sure. Okay. Just waiting for people to leave and I will stop recording now.